Great. Good morning. So I'm Skip Shapiro from NetApp, and I'm a technical marketing engineer uh, responsible for two of the three products I'm going to talk to you about. Okay. Um, you just saw, um, if you watched the video, you saw Nathan use this uh, same slide, and I'm going to talk about the left hand, left hand side. And so the products in, in particular are Flash Excel, uh, Flash Cache, and Flash Pool. And I'll be starting uh, with Flash Cache, which actually is the um, first Flash product that we introduced uh, nearly four years ago. Uh, before I do that, a little bit more information about what the, uh, the products are. So Flash Excel is NetApp software that runs up in a, in a server, and it uh, does the management of data in the server cache. And it assures that there's data coherency between a system running data on tap, storage system running data on tap, and the data that's cached up in the, in the server. <clears throat> and Flash Cache is a, a storage controller based PCI Express card. Um, and depending on the controller size, you can have uh, multiple cards that act as a single cache uh, to provide uh, caching for reads. And then uh, Flash Pool uh, is similar in concept, but instead of in the controller, it's down on top of the disk drives. So it provides a hybrid uh, storage pool uh, that has caching within the, the pool using SSDs to do that. Uh, before I get into the products, let's talk about our approach, NetApp approach to uh, storage tiering uh, versus what you commonly see out in uh, the market. So um, many storage vendors have an automated storage tiering um, architecture and paradigm. And uh, what that does is move data around based on some heuristics on what they think uh, data was hot, right? Because it's not real time. Um, uh, and the, the issue around that is, it sounds great at a high level, the issue around that is you're explicitly using system resources to move data around. And that, therefore, those resources are not available to serve uh, data up to clients and applications. It also means that you're reserving capacity at every tier to accept data that's going to be migrated. So both of those things, from a performance standpoint and from a capacity standpoint, you've got overhead to do this housekeeping. Uh, activity. Um, when we looked at this four, uh, five or six years ago, we said that's, you know, that's pretty heavyweight um, way to solve the ultimate problem, which is customers want to deliver the performance that I need at the lowest cost possible to do that. So we've taken this uh, uh, approach, which is for caching. So data, you, you provision the storage, you provision the data on the storage tier uh, where it makes sense to be, and we give you know, customer's advice on, on how to do that. And then as data is pulled up and read, we extend the cache capability for those, those reads. So as you see, I've got dotted lines here because we're not explicitly moving data for that purpose. So flash cache, again, caching in the controller. You have the choice of flash pool to cache down on top of disks, and I'll explain in a little while why you'd choose one over the other. Uh, and this is a lightweight way of doing things. We don't have to reserve extra capacity. We're not moving data around, especially for uh, um, migration purposes and for caching purposes, uh, for tiering purposes. And it works with all the, uh, the data on tap capabilities, storage uh, efficiency capabilities, data uh, protection capabilities. So it's, you know, it's, it's fully integrated in that way. Okay. Most of the time, caching is a better idea than actually tiering. I got to say, calling your caching virtual storage tiering does nothing but confuse the market. There is nobody in the world that hears the term virtual storage tiering and says, we've only done the tiering virtually by caching because tiering is a bad idea. So, <coughs> Howard, the way I look at that is some people, and you know, may, there, some customers may react well, this customer, this vendor told me I need this. And that's one solution. I need automated storage tiering. That's their solution to the problem. Right. And then right? it sounds like you're not providing that, but named your product so that it sounds like you're providing that to fool the customer. Uh, I wouldn't say fool the customer. So we, you know, we've tried this in the past, I guess, where we use a different terminology. And the customers say, well, you don't have, you don't have that term, so we're not buying your stuff. So, but you don't have that technology, but you have that term. Right. And, and that's nothing but misleading. <laughs> but, but, well, I guess I, I, we could we could disagree on that. We have a solution that addresses their problem in a different way. I, we think I'll, give, way. You, I'll yeah. give you that completely. Right. I'll give you, it might even address their needs better. 
Right. <laughs> well, and it gets us into the conversation, right? If we, if we, what it typically happens, you don't have stores tearing in there. They say, I don't want to talk to you. You put this out there, and then you say, so you're, you know, I'll, I'll grant you, Howard, you're more sophisticated, more astute than many of our customers are, um, you know, at least to get into the door and talk to them. So that's the reason for the name. Okay. So let me talk about Flash Cash. So as I said, that's the product we've had um, around the longest that uses Flash. So this is a PCIe card you put in the controller, currently available in three capacities. And we have two terabyte capacity card that'll be out next month, actually. Uh, so a little heads up on that. So uh, it's, it fits into PCI Express slots in our mid-range and high-end uh, systems, the 3000 and 6000 series systems. And if you look at the top-end systems, you can have 16 terabytes of of cache, of, of read cache, which is huge. Those are large working sets. You, you can cache, if they're very active, you could cache entire data sets uh, potentially to do that. Um, the benefits are, you know, so customers really take it um, uh, for one or two reasons. Right? They have high performance disks, 10K or 15K RPM drives, but they're gonna give you, you know, what, four to eight millisecond response time, maybe. And they'd like one to two millisecond response time on their hot data, so add, um, cache for that, for the repeat random reads. The flip side is, gee, can you give me the same performance I'm getting today, maybe even a little bit better, and do it uh, with less expense? So instead of using the high RPM drives, uh, I'd rather put my data on fewer 7200 RPM drives and, and uh, achieve the same result from performance. So that's the other way that customers take advantage of it. Okay. Uh, it's, you know, as, as our systems are block and file based storage, the cache works with that um, uh, as well. And it's very simple to use. Put the card in, enable the software, and then the caching oh, algorithms yeah. built into ONTAP and that have been enhanced uh, from release to release uh, do the rest of the work. So no extra administration required. Um, the way the read caching process works and, um, is uh, first reads. Uh, so data is written to disk. First reads are going to come from disk. Uh, then uh, the data resides in a memory buffer uh, up in DRAM. Uh, that's a, you know, relatively small compared to the extended cache. So when that ages out, because there's hotter data uh, coming in, uh, the data can move to the extended cache and flash cache, and then subsequent read requests come out of the cache. And then eventually, um, the data will age out of uh, flash cache. And flash cache works as a straightforward revolving FIFO cache. So when the cache is full, I'm using all the resources, time to free up uh, a page or a block of, of uh, flash for new data coming in, data gets ejected, and uh, new data comes in. Is that to save system resources, or is that just because you guys found that works better? Uh, doing it as FIFO? Yeah. Uh, so this was the you know, pretty straightforward implementation. We're using this as an extended cache memory, so that's, that's the reason for that. When I get into flash pool, we have a little more sophisticated uh, heuristics and can keep data around longer. I'll, I'll talk about that. So, so the ejection algorithm is least recently entered into cache? So it's ba if you think of it as I've got a revolving FIFO cache, right? I've got pages, n number of pages in, in, the, in the cache, right? When page one comes up, I fill the cache to all the way to page n. Page one comes up because I got more data coming in. Everything that was in page one gets evicted you know, the, uh, the cache is erased <coughs> and, and new data comes in. Re regardless of whether that's yeah, being if, frequently accessed. That's correct. So there could be data in that page that was frequently, that was just accessed and hot data, and you'd like to keep it around, it's going to have to come from disk. So it's simple to use, but it's not as sophisticated as Flash Pool, which I'll talk about. It's been very effective for customers in many, in a whole host of, of uh, Deployments. The 36 uh, petabytes that Nathan talked about, that's probably uh, two thirds to three quarters flash cache. And we were shipping, customers were buying this, you know, 50% 50, 50 to two thirds of the systems going out the door, mid range and high end systems were going out with cash, and customers were, were benefiting from that. And so it's not perfect, and, but. And you do this instead of least recently used or least frequently used just to save CPU cycles? Uh, I don't know if it's to save CPU cycles, it's, it's, it's simple. We'd, we're not storing, it's not SSD, so we're not writing to it in the same way you write to storage. So, no, I mean, I, back I, I understand the cache, yeah. but LRU and LFU are, are, you know, 
generally considered to be really, you know, yeah. really simple so, cache e ejection algorithms. Yeah. So that, that's the approach we took. Was just simple based on based on the hardware. So we that's that's correct. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, additional things about flash cache: you can put multiple cards into the controller, and it acts as one um, uh, cache resource. Uh, the policies, the basic way to use it is uh, the cache is available to all volumes that are provisioned underneath that uh, controller. If a volume doesn't have hot data, it won't use the cache. If it does, uh, it, it'll use it. So it's, you know, it's dynamic uh, in terms of uh, the allocation uh, that way. We're, we're caching at the 4K uh, block uh, level. Um, and this is uh, dedupe and clone aware. So if there are multiple logical references to the same physical block of data, we only need one 4K block in cache and, in fact, in memory uh, to serve that, that data. So that means we can, we can cache more um, uh, unique data that way. It's also, you know, metadata is cached there as well. So, you know, directories and metadata within data on tap. On tap has an indirect um, addressing, you know, inode uh, architecture. And uh, that's where a lot of the speed up comes from. You keep those inodes. Those inodes are hotter than the user data. And those are kept in cache. And so uh, that's accelerating the performance. And as I said earlier, it works with our replication. It works with our disk-to-disk -disk backup. Uh, I mentioned it works with dedupe and cloning. So all the things you expect to use out of a data on tap uh, based NetApp system, uh, you can do with, with uh, flash cache. Um, here's an example of um, uh, a file services workload and the benefits that come from this. So the baseline before was done with 240 10K RPM drives. After adding a terabyte of flash cache, so half a terabyte in each controller, uh, able to get by with uh, fewer disk drives and slower disk drives and deliver, <coughs> therefore, lower cost per terabyte, lower cost per IOPS, less power, and actually better performance, both throughput and response time. So this is a very typical deployment and, and use of, uh, of flash cache for our customers. Um, I've got some customer examples, which I'll just build out. Here's a pharmaceuticals. Industry customers doing um, replication between two uh, NetApp systems, 80 terabytes of, of data. They're doing replication for both DR and backup and using dedupe, and they've got flash cache on uh, to accelerate this. They're doing this with, uh, with um, uh, slow drives, with 7,200 RPM drives. Another customer example, uh, and this is for an Oracle data warehouse. Uh, this is an insurance company. So their uh, performance was bound by the number of spindles they had, and reports were taking three days to generate. They added uh, flash cache to that system. Their response time uh, dropped by a factor of seven to a, a millisecond and a half, and their reports completed in less than 24 hours. So a very happy customer. <coughs> okay, so that was flash cache. Um, flash pool, um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we're taking SSDs and take a RAID group of SSDs, add it to a storage pool of one or more RAID groups of, of hard disk drives, and that becomes the cache for volumes provisioned on that set of disks. Uh, so we're using SSDs as a cache. I often call it as a, as a storage masquerading as cache. Um, uh, the, the drives, uh, the hard drives are one type from a performance standpoint, so you can use this with a pool of 15K drives or 10K drives or 7,200 RPM drives. You don't have a multiple tiers of, of hard drives in this. It caches both random reads and random overwrites. So if you have frequent updates of the same data, think of a trading account, instead of writing those updates to disk drives and then have them being invalidated shortly thereafter by the next update, we cache them in the SSD and save those disk IOs for other more useful uh, this is supported throughout our product line from the entry-level systems all the way up to the um, high-end systems. Uh, and we've got three sizes of uh, SSDs we're supporting now and, um, you know, all the types of HDDs as well. So we introduced this uh, about 10 months ago. Uh, it has many of the same benefits that I shared with you on flash cache, plus um, a few others. So one is uh, when the cache, flash cache is in the controller, if the controller goes offline, planned or unplanned event, your cache disappears, right? So that can affect your performance. With flash pool, uh, you don't have that, that uh, issue. 
because the, the caching of the storage, that's available to both controllers in a high availability pair, and so things just keep on trucking uh, just as if uh, nothing had happened. You also have uh, the ability to set different caching policies on a per volume basis. So one volume, maybe you want, uh, there's no point in having the write uh, cache enabled, you just keep the, the read cache enabled, and another volume you want both, both enabled. And then um, for the, the random overwrite um, uh, uh, workloads, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the first writes, uh, I'll, I'll, do, I'll show you how the process works. So basically, <coughs> those continuous updates, we can cache uh, in SSD instead of writing to the disk. And in that particular case, it is the storage. The only copy of the valid data uh, resides on the SSDs. Yes, Enrico. Uh, um, actually, uh, the NVRAM has a big role in the NetApp. Uh, yes, it does. So okay, NVRAM now, uh, well. How it works with uh, SSDs? Because uh, in the past, uh, if I remember well, you do all the operation, write operation on NVRAM, and then you, you write the strike. Okay, yes. This. So, but with this new layer in the middle is... Yeah, so, so let me explain that. And actually, this might be an opportunity to, to, to whiteboard if, um, if you'd like, and I'll just pull that uh, over. Um, and actually, I, I have a depiction uh, of it. In you know, why don't I do that? I have a slide that shows you the, the process, and I'll explain it there. I think that's, that's probably the, the best way to do it. So sorry for that. Um, uh, so uh, just, just quickly, Enrico, uh, we write actually to DRAM and back protect the data in NVRAM. We're not, the write path doesn't go through at NVRAM. So it's, it's there as a backstop in case power gets lost, for example. And then uh, the writes go from NVRAM to the SSDs. So, so incoming data goes to DRAM and NVRAM in parallel? Uh, effectively, yes, it's sort of se sequential. Write it to, uh, but immediately sequential. It goes right to uh, memory, so write cache within memory in the controller, and then it's, uh, it's copied uh, to NVRAM. If it's block data, it's copied to NVRAM. If it's uh, NAS data, it may not be all the data. It may just be the operation. You know, if it's like, you know, create a new file, right, that, that, that's, that's an operation. That's then, how it works. And then it gets act once it's in NVRAM? Uh, that's correct. Once it's backed in NVRAM, it's acknowledged back to the, the host or client. Uh, and then periodically, depending on whether uh, it could be uh, threshold-based or time-based, um, we flush uh, the write cache then to storage, whether it be SSD or HDD, that flush happens. So it's no more than 10 seconds, and uh, sometimes can be more frequent than that. It means that the, the latency will grow. No, it doesn't, because we acknowledge back to the host or client as soon as it's in, in uh, write cache and backed by NVRAM. Okay. So the host and client don't, doesn't know anything about what's happening on the back end. All right? So I'll, I'll, I have a, a slide that depicts that for you. So first, the recaching process, um, I'll go through this very quickly. It looks very much like flash cache, except that the resource that we're using, in, instead of uh, moving uh, data out of memory when, it's, when it ex expires. We're instead of moving to a card, we're moving it to the SSDs. Okay? Then the subsequent requests come from the SSD cache. And then the, the block is kept in read cache until uh, the space is needed. And this becomes a cold block relative to everything else that's available. So this is what differentiates it from a read cache standpoint with flash cache. So we have a heuristic here which looks at how recently the data was accessed, and um, we keep it around. In fact, we have a five-level tier of priority. So if a data if data is hot, and, but it sits on SSD in a in a page of the the flash that needs to be refreshed, and it's still hot data, we write it out to a, another page in the cache. So we keep it around. So, so more persistence. So that's an LRU cache. Yes. That's correct. <coughs> okay, the right caching process, and this will illustrate for you, uh, Enrico, um, how things work. So data, that was very quick. So data comes into memory, then gets written to NVRAM, and then, uh, you know, once NVRAM gets flushed, it gets written to disk. <coughs> uh, then when an, uh, an update, an overwrite update, arrives into memory, we have heuristics that look at how, how old was, or how long has it been since the last data was written there? And it says, okay, that's pretty recent. 
uh, recently, recent update, we're going to write it to the cache. And it goes in the, in, the, in the right cache. And we read out of the right cache as well. So if you have a, a workload that says, gee, I'm updating the data, reading it back, updating it again, reading it back, Facebook page, you know, transaction processing, you're getting both right cache benefit offloading uh, um, that workload from that wasteful workload to the HDDs, and you're getting the read benefit back as well. So it's a dual benefit um, of, of having it in, in the right cache. But doesn't that require you to keep access time metadata for every block across all of the HDDs? So we look at uh, what the activity on the, the storage pool, that aggregate, and, and get a sense of what the age is of the, that particular block, how long it's been around relative to everything else uh, in, in the storage pool. So that's the mechanism for determining how old it is. But we, we don't have to look at A time for, for, every, for every block to do that. So you've got a, a limited size, frequently updated block table kind of thing? So that it's less metadata? Well, mean, it's just I mean, yeah, I mean ONTAP metadata has, a, has, a, has this sense already. It's not something we had to, had to, had to build in, you know, how, how recently we've updated the block. So we, you know, we, we do oh, okay. So, yeah. so on each block update, you can see the timestamp of the last update and, yeah. and measure the difference. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then if that's less than some threshold, this is a, this should be a cached block. Yeah. And it's, it's relative to how busy things are. So if, if you do an update, right, the, the threshold right. threshold varies based on right. the age right. of the. If we're not blocks pushing the cache, the, if the, if there aren't updates pushing stuff out of the cache, it'll stick around longer, right? So it's 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 dynamic that way, okay. and so um, the idea behind this is to offload the the data that's being constantly overwritten. There's no point in writing it to SSD if it's eventually going to go to HDD because then you've got two write operations when one would have been <laughs> just fine. So, so the idea well, of this depend, offload. Depends how limited CPU is as a resource. If, if I've got plenty of CPU, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's true. Uh, right? yeah. You would care less if you've got plenty of CPU. And you're not taxing your, your disks either. Right? Well, no, because, I mean, it, yeah. it's a cache. Eventually, it's got to get, you know, you know, eventually it's going to get to disk. So it, what you're really saying is that, you know, in fact, you know, in yeah. fact, you're taxing the disk harder because you've got to read the last update timestamp off that block, which is going to be a disk well, I.O. So, you know, we keep track of how hot uh, the write cache is as well. So, you know, the best sort of deployment of this is I'm updating, think of a trading account again. I'm updating the trading account. The balance keeps changing. At yeah. some point, the balance is stable, and then I write it to disk, and that's what this takes care of. So all those intermediate updates, don't waste disk I.O.s for those. Okay. Makes sense. And this all gets flushed on a snapshot, or the or the snapshot reads the cache. So to flush, it gets flushed to disk in a normal uh, consistency point write that goes to disk. We'll say, aha, here's data sitting on SSD. It's now it hasn't been updated in a while. It's time to move it. I need to move it out of cache because there's hotter data. So it gets just like an incoming write request. It gets into a, a CP and goes out to to disk. Okay. So we treat it no differently than if it came in first time from a, from a client or a host. OK. So uh, a similar example, but for OLTP workload, uh, this time for flash pool. Um, so 10,000 RPM drives, again, in the before scenario. After scenario, moved to 7,200 RPM drives. Uh, uh, somewhat fewer of those, but not a huge amount. So what is it, 10% fewer drives uh, and higher capacity drives. So the benefit here is lower cost per terabyte again, lower cost per IOP, less power, uh, more storage capacity in this case, and the same performance. So here, you know, OLTP, you wouldn't normally think about putting OLTP on slow drives. And we have customers doing this uh, now. They're saying, gee, I want to do that. Right? I want to save money. And if, I can, if you can get the, um, the performance that they need at a lower cost, they're happy. What are the, the constraints on? how much flash I can have and flash to disk ratios and such in pools. So between flash cache and flash pool, it's a little bit uh, different since flash cache is a uh, extended memory resource, if, if you will. We keep the tags in, in memory, in DRAM, 
for pointers to the, the data in cache. So we have a ratio in there. It's, a, it's a roughly about a third. We don't want to get above a, a third, because otherwise you're stealing memory away from your, your read buffers. Uh, with Flashpool, we actually have a very low memory footprint. We keep a lot of that tag on the SSDs and, and fetch it. So more of the metadata might be in memory, and then the actual you know, user, uh, uh, some of the less frequently used metadata will be on SSD, and we'll pull it from there as we need be. So we're, we're up at, um, uh, let's see, 24 terabytes you can have on our, our highest end controllers now with uh, data on tap 8.2. Uh, so a so system that's got 96, uh, 192 gigabytes of memory between the two controllers can have 90, sorry, 24 terabytes of flash pool cache behind it okay. if you chose to do that. And those numbers will likely go up uh, in, in the future. Okay. Uh, here's a uh, customer example, um, customer who's deployed uh, Flash Pool. So this was a varied workload uh, environment, you know, uh, VMware, uh, virtual machines, um, uh, custom apps running on databases, Exchange, uh, Windows file services. Um, and the challenge the customer had was particularly around the financial analysis and reporting they were doing and the client access. Things were slow. They were sometimes experiencing hundreds of milliseconds uh, of response time. Um, so, you know, obviously that didn't ingratiate uh, IT to, their, to the end users. So they added, uh, they created flash pools by adding SSDs, which, by the way, you can do on the fly. So I'm running the system. I add my RAID group of SSDs, enable it on, the, uh, on that aggregate, and the data starts getting cached in the flash pool. Don't, no downtime required to do that. Their latency dropped to five milliseconds. Uh, they saved money. Uh, on space and um, energy by doing this, and uh, they could uh, forestall the need for um, additional capacity uh, by doing this as well. Okay? So, uh, so in summary, the, what we're telling customers on deployment, uh, you know, the, the way to look at this, because there is quite a bit of overlap in terms of read cache benefits between flash pool and flash cache, is that Mission critical applications, which define, at least in this um, terminology, is an application where you want consistent performance no matter what's happening on the, the back end of, of storage. And so if there's a controller failover or you're doing unplanned or you're doing a planned failover because you're doing a, a code upgrade, uh, you don't want your performance to suffer because the cache uh, went away. That's a time to use flash pool. Uh, if you've got uh, workloads that have a high mix of uh, random overwrites, yep, you want to use it. If you need different caching policies uh, per volume within a flash pool, you want to do it. And then our entry systems where we don't have a PCI Express slot that'll fit flash cache, this is the choice. Otherwise, you know, flash cache is the simplest thing for customers to use, and it's been proven by their deployment. So we say, start there. And you can actually have both uh, flash cache and flash pool in the same system. Data gets cached in only one resource. If you've got a pool of disks that has uh, SSDs in it for a flash pool, that's the cache resource. And then the, the, the volumes that are sitting on disks that don't have SSDs within them use the controller flash cache resource. So, and we have customers doing those um, uh, combined deployments as well. The key thing we see out of all this from our experience with customers and what we've done is that um, it's no longer an option for most deployments to put cache in a storage or not. It's such a valuable resource that you need to deploy. You're going to have workloads as a customer uh, where you need to take advantage of this. And you have to think a little bit with flash pool, because unless you have every aggregate as a flash pool, um, uh, about where you want to uh, provision the volume. With flash cache, you don't have to think. It's, you know, it's on the system. You're gonna, you have cache available to you. So it's particularly uh, valuable in private cloud environments and you know, for service providers in the public cloud environment because they don't know what workloads they're getting from their clients. Their clients often don't know what they're giving them, right? So they, they, wanna, they want this at their disposal, take advantage of it. So uh, that's, that's um, our recommendation, okay? So that's the storage level cache products that we've got. Now moving to Flash Excel, which we announced uh, two months ago. So again, this is a server level recache that gets uh, installed up uh, in the physical server. Uh, and um, I'll tell you, there's an agent that gets installed into uh, uh, VM guest OS as well. Uh, so it interoperates with ONTAP to provide uh, the appropriate uh, data coherency. 
And that differentiates, the way we do it differentiates ourselves from other server cache products. And okay, I'll talk about that in a minute. Can we get into some detail there? Yes, I will. It's coming up, Howard. Oh, good. Okay. So uh, the, the basic thrust here is use this as a complement to storage cache, where it's important to have uh, the fastest possible response time or the most efficient use of your server by caching right at that, at that level. Um, because uh, if, if, the, if there's a high hit rate for reads, um, uh, it'll benefit you. If it's not so high, you're going to still be reliant on storage uh, cache uh, to give you good performance. Okay? Um, I'm focused on, focusing on Flash Excel here, but it's part of a larger program uh, where we've got a, an open, uh, open environment partnering with uh, the companies you can see at, at the bottom uh, to make Flash Excel work with their hardware uh, and, and, and also supporting customer environments where they're not even using Flash Excel. Uh, they're using hardware and software from, from our partners. And then specifically with Fusion IO, we entered into agreement with them last year to resell um, uh, IO Drive and, and uh, IO Turbine so that our customers, and this is consistent with our approach, our customers have best of breed solutions at their disposal. So, you know, NetApp can't and doesn't choose to do everything in, you know, to meet the uh, complete solution for, for customers. So you know, our approach is to, is to uh, integrate with best of breed uh, components from uh, our, our partners so the customer can get a best uh, overall uh, solution. So uh, Flash Excel, uh, the first release that's available now, we've got a, a roadmap of, of releases uh, planned out for the next couple of years. Um, and it's, so the current release is supported in, in vSphere 5 environments with Windows 2008 R2 guest OSs. Uh, so it's, for it's suited today for a virtualized in, in environment um, where there's a high degree of, of, of read hits. So we have other hypervisors, other guest o, OSs, and physical server support, and other hardware support planned and coming. So we started here because we think this is you know, really right on target. Uh, so that's that's our actually our next uh, release uh, coming and uh, should be by summer summertime. And what about like DDI uh, or VMRDU or whatever? Yeah, so I'm not sure exactly where where that stands, but you know, certainly interested in supporting uh, Linux, Windows 2012 is of interest, <laughs> V. You know, you, you can go down the list. All of those things, and it's, a court, it's, in, it's just what order we're going to do them in, and that's somewhat dependent on what we see from customer demand. So uh, can you use up to two terabytes of uh, cache in the server and have up to 32 VMs uh, caching. Uh, the hardware support right now is SSDs in the server, LSI's <laughs> card, and Micron's card. Um, you know, where the, you know, Fusion I.O. Um, is, oh. is on, the, on the list. So this is not the list that's on the VMware compatibility list, but it's on just a couple of devices. Specific for Flash Excel use, that, that's right. So if you don't use Flash Excel, if you want to use those devices, say IO Turbine and IO Drive with ONTAP, that's supported uh, today. Not with Flash Excel yet. Okay. Just okay? to clarify, when it says the Windows 2008 R2 guest OS, you mean that's the OS running in the virtual machine? That's so correct. Use your 5 .0? That's, that's correct. What? I mean, that seems really specific. We had to start is there, somewhere. Is there an agent running inside the VM? Yeah, I'll show you that. Oh, That's okay. correct. Yes, it is. So, are, we, are you looking to uh, set up 2012 there? Uh, that is um, on the list as, as well, and likely, you know, I can't make promises, but likely to happen this this year by the by the end of this year. So, yeah. So one of the things we look at, you know, you know, I don't. You tell me what what's the adoption you see of customers of Windows 2012 at this point relative to customers who are still. Running earlier, earlier releases. Waiting for all the ecosystem Yeah, so that I mean that's that's what we often key off of, you know. The typical is SP one out yet, right? You know, that's the uh, that, that's kind of the thing. That day has passed. So the the waiting for Service Pack one day passed with Windows two thousand eight, where Service Pack one didn't come out for two years. Yeah. So so you know, there's we, we look at you know we definitely we talk to our customers. Key customers, what are, we look at their environments, what do they want, and that helps, for this particular case, that helps drive the roadmap because it's an integration activity. And um, but we just can't do it all at once. Okay, so cache uh, is enabled, disabled, and resized 
uh, at the VM and VMDK levels. And um, the virtual disks um, caching the fiber channel, fiber channel over Ethernet, iSCSI, NFS, all those available. So here's the architecture. This is a downloadable package off the NetApp support site so our customers can go up there. It's a no charge piece of software because the idea is make your environment with NetApp storage run better, right? Not to nickel, nickel and dime or anything like that. Uh, so uh, there's three components to the download package. Uh, one is an ESX host agent. So that controls the physical devices and it creates logical SCSI devices that enable the dynamic sharing of that physical resource amongst uh, the, the VMs. Then there's a Windows agent, uh, and that uh, passes the configuration to the filter driver, the Windows filter driver, and it integrates with NetApp's um, Snap Drive and Snap Manager software, so you can use that uh, with Microsoft uh, apps uh, in, in particular. Uh, and you can enable, you can use the agent to enable the the cache or disable the cache for the particular VM uh, it's installed in. And then there's a, the third component is a management console. So you do the installation, so it's got a GUI installation uh, process uh, you follow, configures uh, the two agents, discovers and configures the physical devices that are providing the cache. Um, you can enable and disable the cache uh, for the whole host uh, from the console. You can resize uh, caches for, for each of the VMs, uh, and it does the reporting. Do you always need to install the agent within the VM? So one agent in the host, yeah. and then one agent in each VM that you want to be able to, to cache data. So if you have 12 VMs running on an ESX host, you'll have one agent, one, one guest, one, excuse me, one ESX agent, and you'll have 12 uh, agents running one in each of the Windows the 2008 VMs. R2. What's that? Windows 2008 R2. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the management console, is that like a plugin for uh, VMware or is that a GUI? Or? So that's our management console, but we also have the plugin, our virtual storage console um, plugin uh, 4.2 supports this as well. So if you're already using that, you don't need to use the, the, the separate management console. We just, you know, and most, we have a lot of customers using uh, VSC. Okay. So your choice, two tools. Got it. Your choice of one of the tools. So two key areas uh, uh, as part of the Flash Excel software. So the storage manager handles the layout of metadata and user data on, on the device, and it assures that the cache is persistent. So you, the server could go down, could crash, you reboot it, and the cache is still, the data is still in cache. Now it's going to check with storage and make sure nothing's gotten invalidated you know, for, for coherency, uh, but you don't wipe out your whole cache uh, just because the server went down. Uh, and then the cache operations layer translate the IL requests into four kilobyte requests to either the cache or storage, depending on what needs to be done, and it's implemented in the, in the filter driver. So um, this, the Flash Excel will cache all reads that come from storage, whether they're random or sequential. Everything gets cached. Uh, uh, right now, um, and uh, obviously it's only to the, the VMs that are enabled. And then there's um, three cache policies that are uh, possible. So you can use, you know, the default would be write through, which then uh, data comes in, it's written to disk, when it's committed to disk, it's also copied into the, uh, the cache of the server. So you want to make sure you've got it acknowledged but before you're, you're um, populating the cache. Write around says, Okay, you're just going to write to disk and only reads from storage will get cached and then pass through basically says you're, you know, you're, you're bypassing uh, the cache altogether, both for, for reads and writes. Okay, so uh, I'm probably speaking to the choir here. Data coherency between server cache and storage cache is critical. Otherwise, uh, you're in trouble. What's different about the way we do it is we can assure the, the coherency at 4K block level. Uh, so uh, the way Flash Excel works is uh, when a snapshot's taken on the storage, snapshot copy is taken on the storage, the metadata state of cache on the server is incorporated into that snapshot on storage as well. So if, I don't know, you're running Exchange in that VM and the Exchange database crashes and you need to recover 
from a, with Snap Restore from a snapshot copy. The recovery says, looks at the state uh, in the, um, of the server cache and compares it to the state in the snapshot, what 4K blocks are different, and validates uh, the ones that are different in the server cache. And the rest of what's cached in the server is still intact. So you don't have to rewarm the whole cache, only the 4K blocks uh, that need to be repopulated uh, that are different. So that's huge to keeping uh, your cache uh, warmer and active compared to what you can, what others can do. And so that's the level of integration we've got with, on, with ONTAP. Uh, there are more things we intend to do in the, in the future, but uh, you know, we, we think this is significant. Were those cache policies set at the volume level? The there, there are, so the, you set those at the, at the VM level. So at you'd the use the, okay. uh, one of the two management tools to say, you know, yeah, I want to use write through or I want to use with that agent. Uh, write. Um, with the agent, right? What's that? With the agent? Yeah, with the agent. Well, the, the console will do it, uh, will set it for you, and the, but, the agent will run it. But it happens run. with the agent. Yes, that's correct. So, <coughs> Skip, are you going to work on those Excel agents? Because the customers I know don't want to install any more agents in their VMs or on physical servers for that matter. Well, there's a problem there because many customers I know don't want that. They want agentless. Uh, uh, yeah, I can, I can hear you. It, it's, it's lightweight. The all, I don't know of another way for us to enable on tap. That, that integrates with ONTAP to, to, to be resident in the server without installing something. And how do you do it? Unless they have to install a piece of hardware that has our software on it, and that's not the direction we've, uh, where we've chosen uh, to take. Or because at least integration with the vShield endpoint or whatever they're calling it, vCNS endpoint or whatever they're calling it now. I mean, if we could convince VMware to say, you know, the part of their package includes the, uh, the, the agent itself, right? that's one less thing that that customers need to do. I mean, it's, it's a good point. So customers, there, you know, many customers are, are leery of these extra things, right? It's either it's management overhead and it's also, gee, can I really trust it, right? So hopefully they can, you know, they're not worried about trusting it from us, but it's, you know, it's just it's just one more thing. Well, not to, to mention do. storms, I mean, update storms if the agent needs to update, things like that. Yeah, I mean, how, I mean as I said, it's a, it's a management hassle if it's, if it's their, um, a stream of, of updates. It's pretty lightweight, so there isn't there isn't a whole lot um, uh, to do. Uh, but you know, as new functionality comes out, mm. you know, the agents uh, uh, will, will change. A agents are inherently evil. There's yeah, just how evil is it? You know, a lightweight agent that doesn't need to get updated very often is only a little evil. Yeah, it's yeah, it's less painful. A abs absolutely. So, one more thing on that. Sure. It's uh. Implemented at the Windows filter driver you said on one slide back. Uh, yeah, so that that's the um, OS it? agent works with the uh, Windows filter driver. That's correct. It works with it. Yeah, so okay. configuration information right. is sent to the filter driver. All right. I just that's want correct. to clarify that. Um, here's an example of a, a workload. We ran an uh, Exchange workload um, here. So the before scenario, uh, the storage had flash cache in. We had um, 72, 7,200 RPM drives. And then by adding um, Flash Excel and 800 gigs of, of server cache uh, capability, we needed a third fewer uh, drives. Um, and in addition to less storage on the back end, the workload, uh, not surprisingly, on the storage was reduced as well. So CPU uh, utilization dropped on, on the storage uh, controllers and um, the memory consumption uh, dropped as well because there was less data we had to cache uh, in memory. Okay. I have a question for you, uh, <coughs> actually, and what, what uh, maybe you're seeing with your customers. One thing we're paying close attention to is as server caching, caching the server becomes more prevalent, and I mean, it certainly looks like you know, it's more cache is going to be present in servers by default. I mean, it may be hard to buy a server without it. Um, that we see workload patterns changing somewhat uh, on storage. That uh, you know, more workload going to uh, to writes. Um, and is, is is that what you're hearing from it's, customers you're talking it's to? It's still very early days for server side caching. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, num the number of actual installations isn't big enough to draw that kind of conclusions from. You know, plus the server-side caching products that are available today are all right through or right around. And it'll be different with right back. And when we start doing right back, you know, that, that's all going to change just completely. Um, 
because that's something we're looking at very, very closely. Because we're, you know, there. I wouldn't say we're concerned. We're, we, we could be a workload, significant change in workload on the storage um, yeah. side of things. So. You know, I and mean, we can we can talk about it in detail offline. But I think that there's, you know, there there are architectures where um, you do right through at the serve right through at the server level and optimize the back end storage for right heavy environments that mm -hmm. could be a very in, attractive mechanism. Um, so the only real coordination that you're doing between the storage system and the cache is this flush on snapshot, re snapshot uh, that's correct. Snap on snapshot reversion. Uh, th that's correct. So that's, okay. that's the current um, uh, level of intimacy between flash Excel and data on tap. Uh, we have other things planned. So one thing we're looking at, or you know, uh, dedupe, taking advantage of, of uh, deduplication capability between storage and server. So anything we can do that um, provides more intimate integration and will benefit the customer, we're you know we're we're on a path to do. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of potential there that nobody's really <clears throat> addressing yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just to wrap it up. Uh, you know, we think the approach we've taken with virtual storage tiering or caching, as Howard per would, uh, would prefer, and, and actually I'm happy with that as, as well, we think that's a better approach to solving a uh, problem than moving data around. It's more efficient. Customers get uh, uh, more benefit uh, out of that. Um, we also think that you know, caching, um, extended cache capabilities and storage is, is here to stay, I and mean, it's just standard kind of deployment capability, and the question is, how much do you need and, and where, do you, where exactly do you need it? And then server cache right now is sort of selective uh, um, complement. Do you have workloads that will specifically benefit from additional caching at the server level?